Okay, so uh, I want to just quickly touch on this. Everybody, I have the tests. Um, so there's a couple things you can do. Obviously, you can't take AP again. Um, I guess you could, but I've never had anybody do that. Uh, so some of you, you might have already taken AP Bio, and, but I'll just say I'm just this is I'm just spending a couple minutes on this, not very much. Uh, talk to other people in the classes. It's always great. I always think it's funny when people come and ask me about AP Chem because no matter what I say, uh, the perspective of what you have is is the better perspective. Um, so you can take AP Bio. Uh, that's usually taught by Mrs. Verts. Uh, there's AP Physics One. That's uh, usually Mr. Blackford. If you are in AP Physics One right now, there is I didn't write it on here in AP Physics Two that you can sign up for. It has not yet been offered, but more and more students continue to sign up for it. Uh, and when I say more, it's like from three to four. Last year was six. But eventually it will run. One day it will. So maybe next year is the year. Uh, you have general anatomy with Mr. Anderson. You get four uh, NWTC credits. Uh, you get to work with cadavers. Some I mean, of you are in it right now. Um, AP environmental science with Mrs. Tut. Uh, that's a a full year AP class, but it resembles a half a year of college. So the pacing is a little different, uh, but it, it's a good class. Uh, you could just take physics. You could. You could take intro to physics, which is basically like a, a amped up uh, lab science. It's second semester only. Um, yes. Why I hesitate only is that you're an AP Chem, so I would have a I would have a real hard time seeing you in Intro to Physics. I don't know about that one. Uh, you got Earth Science uh, with Miss Welsing. Uh, learn about Earth systems and and all that good stuff. And then finally, Basic Anatomy. The difference with that, some of you might be in that now, is a little less memorization. You still get a nice taste of it. But anybody who's potentially thinking about going into any kind of any kind of medical anything uh, might want to get a taste of of that. But a lot of memorization in both those. Uh, so just be ready for that. Don't be all of a sudden shocked. Be like, oh my gosh! Like I didn't know I had to know all these names and terms. Like, yeah, you do. That's that's a lot of the class. Um, I don't think I'm missing anything. So uh, please, if you have any questions, let me know. But usually, I go to the horse's mouth on that. Either other students or the teacher uh, themselves. Uh, but um, urge you to continue on. Obviously, if you're a senior, uh, you could still take intro to physics next semester. Yes. But that's it. Okay. So. Anywho, all right. So uh, we'll talk about that uh, more if you have any questions on it. Okay. All right. So yesterday or last two days, and I'm not giving time. Like right now, you're not going to write this all down. This was on. Uh, I recorded the last two days of lecture for you. Uh, and it may seem a little confusing, but hopefully we'll uh, help you out a little bit. Here's what I need to get across to you right now. So here's a little recap. There are three uh, kinds of IMFs that you really need to be extremely familiar with. What are IMFs? They're called intermolecular forces. They're the force between molecules or compounds. We are going to have new notes. If you don't have your notes ready, please do have that ready. Go. So if you have two different compounds, You could have, oh, this is tied for me. How perfect. Oh, the day is going well for me. You could have anybody who has been here. When I do this, this is an actual bonded compound. I do that. What did I just break? I broke a, a bond, which we call what kind of force? An intramolecular force, okay? But if I have two different, please work. Oh, shoot. If I have two uh, molecules or atoms and... Of course, it's more attractive to my hand. <laughs> okay, there we go. So, uh, we, we have two different atoms. My hand is one and the, the uh, balloon is the other. And I want to break that apart. I need to start putting energy into it, potentially. And eventually, well, she just comes right back. Um, I'll overcome that. Well, we can talk about that. We are going to in uh, different kinds of phases and things like that. But there's three kinds. And these are called intermolecular forces, like the interstate or the internet. It's between uh, states or between people or be, uh, with, uh, throughout the world. And uh, again, have a note sheet and everything else, but it's between the molecules themselves 
from one molecule to another. So when I break an IMF, this is really important. If I break an IMF, let's say I'm boiling water, if I overcome this to go from a liquid to a gas, it's still water. But if I break a inter or intramolecular force, I don't have a pen. I was gonna pop this. I would I wouldn't have water anymore. I would rip apart my uh, that's okay. Um, my hydrogen and oxygen molecules. So we have three of them. We had H bonding, which was basically a, a, a dipole on steroids. So it's really souped up dipole. It's really strong. And what a dipole is, you have a positive and a negative end. Okay? And you have to have fun with it. Just, I just want you to have some fun with it. Uh, what it is, is hydrogen bonded to F, O, or N. Okay? So that, and it makes a really strong dipole. If it's not F, O, or N, then it's, it's still a dipole but it's just not as strong. So both of these, what we're going to be focusing on a lot in the next uh, weeks, next couple of weeks, is these are both polar. So if I look at a compound, that's the first question I want to ask. Is something polar or not? If it's really polar, then it's going to be H bonding. If it still has some polarity like this right here, which got broken off here, um, it still has a, a negative end and a positive end, but it's not as strong of a dipole. And then lastly, which I, would, I sent you videos last night, and hopefully you watch them. So if you haven't watched everything, please do so. Uh, the Chem Tour one's a really good one for the, uh, uh, London. There's a thing called London Dispersion Forces, or just London, or just LDs. And what they are, they're really weak. And what it is, is it's literally a temporary dipole that happens when the uh, electrons get uh, imbalanced, or get pushed away from each other. And it constantly will happen. Either they get too close, oh, come on. When one atom gets too... Wow, look at that. What's happening? <laughs> it's all on video. Okay. Uh, when, this, when this electron cloud gets too close to this one, then the electrons are like, whoa, and they move over to the side, and then because they moved over, now there's a charge, and now that can affect this one, and uh, this is positive, so now the electrons will be attracted, and it, it's a chain reaction. Um, I lost that pen. Here we go. Whoa, I actually... Uh oh. <laughs> so that's that. So what I want to do, I, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this because I made this do Friday so I can start class quickly tomorrow on any final questions. But anything that has come up that you just want to hear about, Trina, you are ready. Just like a general question. So like 21 and 23. That's not general. That sounds really specific. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, like 21 and 23. Exactly. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's okay. So it's uh, it's a hydrogen bond, but so like so anything with the F or okay, good. Okay, I got you. I got you. I got you. I got you. So guys, I'm expecting all over this sheet little drawings. Okay, if you weren't here, you had little drawings of things. Your job is to find the strongest. This is the probably answer your question right there. The strongest existing bond. So reminder again, this is the order that you're thinking, and it's not technically just this, but this is the best thing I can tell you for now. Dipole, dipole, and then LD. This is the order, okay? Um, that from strongest to weakest of the, the main four players that we're going to deal with. So all of this right here, yeah, uh, carbon to hydrogen, there's not all that much going on. But right there, that has a hydrogen bond in it, right? So the minute you have a hydrogen bond, then that is the one that you would talk about the most. Now, we're going to actually elaborate on this in the next two days on certain compounds. If this whole thing is really long, and then just right at the end you got this, well, that's going to be great, but all this is kind of nonpolar, let's say, and only this end will be polar. That might behave differently than when it's just um, like water, where you have two hydrogen bonds right here. This is probably going to act a lot more... Uh, a greater force than something that has just a little end to it, okay? If you are really still extremely confused and say, I don't even know what the heck you're talking about, a good term I like to think about is stickiness. Think of it that way. How sticky is one molecule to the other? Okay, the stickier it is, the stronger the force, and that means a lot of things for things we're going to talk about today. Um, so that would have hydrogen bonding still because of the fact that it has it in one spot, then, it, then that's what we're going to count it as. So what column is that? third one. So these would both be hydrogen bonding because that has a little NH on the end. But how we would eventually describe this though, you kind of have two nonpolar ends, like two little nonpolar ends and then one um, 
hydrogen bond on the other end. Okay. What else? So I want to I want to make sure that I'm guiding you towards something. Yeah, Morgan. What about C two H two? Can you tell me a number? What? Okay, so you got to know what that looks like. So that would be uh, C two H two is ethyne. So it would look like this. So. Your first question, you guys, is is that polar or nonpolar? That's where you've got to go first, or else it's going to be ionic or a metal. I, I, those are different side things. So it's, is it polar or nonpolar? And that is nonpolar. So immediately if I say nonpolar, that is London. Is that the first column, I believe? So that's, that's where I would go, okay? So you've got to draw these out. I expect that you don't have to have it all. I mean, you could, I could see a lot of people just doing this, or not even the triple bond, but... The triple bond does help me figure that out. And it doesn't have to be right next to it. It could be anywhere you want to write it. Um, so, for example, I just want to like do 53. AS. If you look at AS, it's in the same column with N and P. So that means it would be like that with the H's. Okay? Well, is that polar or nonpolar? It's polar. So now your mind's got to go to, okay. See, these are polar. These are polar. This is nonpolar. Is that uh, H bonded? And a lot of you... In the beginning, we'll kind of forget what's happening with it. Be like, H bonding, it's H. H bonding, you got to have fun with it. So that is not an F, O, or N. So that would just be considered a dipole, dipole then, because of that. That's all. Yeah. 35? 45. 45. Not to be specific, right? No. Okay. <laughs> Here is what's hard, and I'm going to try to help you as much as I can. Silicone is like carbon. Why? Because it's right below it. If I told you that was carbon and you had C4H10, is that like completely surrounded? Is that saturated, C4H10? Okay, we'll talk about that one for a second. Okay, when it just says silicone and carbons only, what did we learn? What is that, even if you don't have a good understanding about it? It's a network solid because there's nothing else to close it off. Like, it'll just keep going because this bonds four times. This bonds four times. This bonds four times. It just continues to go forever. So that, what, is that the last column? Yeah. Okay. Can I do 46, Mason? Yes. Okay. If that was carbon, C4H10, is that, what is that? Is that full? Is that saturated? C4H10. Think about what we've learned. Okay, silicone and carbon are like the same thing. So, what I'm trying to tell you, it's not just a silicone or carbon's in it. This is completely closed off by hydrogens, meaning it, can't rep it cannot continue on. It, it's closed off, like the molecule's done. So, that's not a network solid. And I'm not going to try to trick you on this stuff. So, if, if you have a little confusion with network solids, it's going to be natural. But, then what does that mean? What is that? Hmm? London. Why? It's totally evenly surrounded. It's nonpolar. So that one actually would be London. If it was um, SI4H8, would it be a network solid? No, it'll never be because once you kind of realize, oh, that's like an organic compound, like a hydrocarbon, then no. It has to be continually repeating. So I'm going to give you a big hint, guys. Those are both what? Network solids. And you're like, whoa, tungsten, what the heck just happened with WC? Don't worry about it. Move on with your life. Uh, this one, that's quartz. I don't know if you know a lot about quartz, but it, it's this basically rock mineral that branches off and continues on until it has like a fracture in it. So it, that, that's a network solid as well. Okay? And uh, SiO2. I know that doesn't seem like it, so I wanted to tell you that. So a lot of you probably would have to erase what you had, but 18. Okay. Any other quick questions? Not quick. I don't mean to say it that way, but specific or non? Sorry. I'm having fun at your expense. C6H6. So what is that? C6H6. I mean, that could relate to this last chapter we just had. That's a cyclohexene. How do you know that? Well, well, that's actually, that's not a benzene, is it? Is it? I'm, a, I'm asking. Are you right? Because each uh, hydrogen is only on one carbon, right? So what would have to be true then? Yeah. So 
So, what does that mean? It's an LD. Wait, with all that, it's an LD? Yeah, it's extremely nonpolar, but it's so symmetrical, right? It, it, the more symmetrical it is, then it's going to be nonpolar. So it doesn't have a lot of polarity. It doesn't have a lot of charge with it, okay? All right. So, all right, we got to go. We can finish talking tomorrow. Tomorrow, we have a lab bet. You just bring your... your uh, Yourselves. If you want to bring your uh, tablet and do it on your tablet instead, you could download it up or upload it in to Notability, and that's great. Otherwise, you can do it on paper as well. Okay. And we're going to be testing some different uh, IMFs and talking about different solutions and things. On Monday, we're going to do Penny Wars, uh, and we'll talk about that later. Okay. So, do not write this down. God, everything's bigger than what I made it. So, uh, I need you to just have an understanding. So. I'm going to read this out loud just so we all are on the same page when, it's, when I talk about phases. Okay, so when I'm going from a solid to a liquid, okay, as energy is added, the motions of the molecules increase. And they eventually achieve the greater movement and disorder characteristic of a liquid. Right, so it's all locked up, right? And then I have a little more movement. If you got to be on this page with me. If not, if you're like, okay, I kind of get that. If not, you have, you're going to have a really hard time understanding energy flow here and, and, and stickiness and IMFs. Liquid to gas. As more energy is added, the gaseous state is eventually reached. Whoa, let's assume that's right, uh, spelling. With the individual molecules far apart and interacting relatively little. The opposite is true if we go in the other direction. You take away the energy and they start to come back together. How do things come back together? How do things re-establish uh, that connection? It's the stickiness. If you have more energy than the stickiness, the IMF, the force that is holding you together, you break apart. If you slow down enough and thou that attractive force is greater than the energy that you possess, you'll come back together. Okay? So that's going to be kind of our world that we're talking about, is going back and forth, and we're going to do some kind of cool things with it. I know it sounds like, wow, we're just going to be melting and freezing water. Awesome. Uh, we're going to do more than that. Okay. So we need to have some understanding. There's some really key words uh, that you need to have uh, down. And try to be smart about uh, how much you're writing, please. Uh, so first, let's talk about liquids. Let's talk about a couple things today. So let's talk about some liquids. There's a couple of huge properties. And I'm sorry that everything's larger than it should be here. It... Um, I don't know. Okay. These are the main terms. I'm trying to give you some ammo. Again, free response. In this chapter, you have maybe one or two sentences per free response. But these are some words that you learned last year, potentially. Maybe not exactly the way um, uh, it was given to you, but low compressibility, meaning I cannot compress. You can pr compress a gas, but it's not like, hey, we have three liters of Mountain Dew left, but I only have this two liter bottle. Just shove it in. Like, you're not going to do it. It's not going to work. And I'm sure some of you try. Just like, Come on, we can do this. And it can a little. You can a little. But when I say a little, I'm not talking a full glass. It's not like, well, I can get one more glass in there. Um, lack of rigidity, though. It's not rigid. You have that motion. That's huge, right? Liquid. It will, you, you've heard this, like, right, like no set volume, or set volume, but no set shape. You learned that in, like, middle school, like, right, a, a solid, it's set volume and set shape. So if you put a, a, a plane block into a round bottom flask, it's not also going to turn round. Uh, but a liquid obviously takes its shape. But it still has a volume. So again, you can't put half of the Mountain Dew in a two liter and be like, whoa, I have made two liters. Um, unless you watered it down, which is probably just gross. Uh, and then high density compared to gas. It is very dense. Okay. All right. Well, what are we going to do with all that? Okay. There are some major terms. So I put them in red. These are the ones that you're going to be applying tomorrow as well. These are all the things that will be asked of you on the test. These are the things that we are going to start relating IMFs to. So when I ask, see, I, maybe it's just me. I think it's cool when you can start predicting stuff without actually doing it. Not that I don't love doing it, but I can actually predict a reaction. I can predict that this thing is going to be doing that over that other one without ever doing the experiment. I like to have that feeling like I have that extra knowledge. I'm understanding the chemistry and the, some physics. So surface tension. 
It's the resistance of a liquid to an increase in its surface tension. And it's really important to understand you are attracted to, it's actually attracted to itself. So like when it makes a rain, like a bubble, like on a surface, the reason why it's making that bubble is you have this attractive force and we're going to call, I'm going to name it that uh, a word in a minute. Um, but you actually are attracted to yourself, uh, not in a vain way. Mm -hmm. Just staring in the mirror, surface tension. Um, so, liquids with blank IMFs tend to have higher surface tensions. Well, again, if you're more attracted to yourself than the surface on the um, table, then you are probably very sticky, right? You're, you're, you're attracted to other compounds or molecules in the compound. So, the greater the IMFs tend to have greater surface tension. Can, Select how much you want to write. Just get the, the ideas down here. Um, I'm just trying to be thorough today. So I believe I have a cool picture here. Uh, this is one of my favorites. And you can do this with like a paper clip on water, but you wouldn't be able to see it as well. But like a bug sitting on water, uh, you can see that surface tension. It's not breaking through the water. It actually is dipping down, which is just a crazy idea. You, you can take like water in a, on a Petri dish or just on a surface and you can put a paper clip on it and it'll float on it and you can actually see the water bending down and around that paper clip. So that, that water can hold up that bug uh, because it's still more attracted to uh, itself. Uh, it's sticky enough that the force of this uh, uh, insect is not pushing through the water. I was going to show the video of like the lizard. I think, I don't know what they call it. It runs on the water. The Jesus Christ lizard or whatever. But um, that's what all the YouTube videos say. But that's not just surface tension because they have huge pads. That's more than just surface tension. It's not like he's actually walking on the water and he's not breaking through or anything like that. So anyway. Okay. Next one. Capillary action. Okay, make sure you get these terms for sure. And I know I'm kind of giving it to you, but because of it's a large group, I, I need to get these terms out. And then we're going to exercise and practice these. Those of you that have missed, or maybe you were you blacked out while you were here and you don't really realize that you were. Um, if you're not understanding things, it, you can't use this as a crutch. You guys, I, I understand some of you are in, it's, it's tough. You guys are in some tough classes, but find me when you can or talk to others or watch the videos. Please just rewatch some of these videos. I, I, I knew that was going to happen, so I tried to help out. Oh, what the heck is that? Oh. So here we go. Here's two huge words. So capillary action is spontaneous rising of a, a liquid in a narrow tube. So you, you can see that actually every time you've ever worked in a chemistry lab, I'll talk about that in a moment, when water rises up on surfaces, although wood kind of absorbs it, but it also does rise because it's attracted to it. So like when a basement floods, it also rises up in your walls. Some of that, some of that is capillary action. Well, there are two forces that are happening and these are vital to understand. And then um, I'll show you what I am meaning by that. Cohesive, sorry if you can't see in the back. Do I need to go back up? We, okay. Cohesive and adhesive. And you probably heard of these terms before. We have a cohesive unit here. For like the Packers uh, uh, locker room, we're a cohesive. They, they stay together. Um, adhesive probably sounds like a glue. And hopefully, oh, is that yours? Yeah. I was going to keep it, it looked good. Um, <laughs> adhesive, like I think of like an adhesive, and uh, like a glue. Uh, um, These forces are very different though. So cohesive units of forces are IMFs among the molecules of the liquid. Adhesive forces are between the liquid molecules and their container. So I want to show a picture of that. Actually, I'll just wait a second. I'll just draw it right here. So if you had a grad cylinder, okay. First off, the fact that it rises up by the way, you know, what is that called when it does this? Like, you read the meniscus, right? Only reason why there's a meniscus, by the way, is that the rising up is the capillary action. Okay? Why? Is because the adhesive force between the H2O and the glass. It's attracted to the glass. There is adhesive forces going on there. So I always think of adhesive like you, it's sticky to something else. 
So it's, it's rising up on the side also because it's attracted to the glass and actually less attracted to itself. So that's why it makes this shape. So the cohesive force in this case, in this case, the adhesive is greater than the cohesive in this case. That's why it's rising up. And I can show you a different example in a minute. It's right below that it's the exact opposite. You're like, whoa, everything does that. What are you talking about? And it doesn't. When you wax a car, when I wax my Prius, <laughs> hey, it might need it. What, why do you wax a car? To protect it, to, to protect the coating, to keep out the rain, which brings dirt and other things, right, that can damage your car, uh, to protect it so it doesn't maybe start to rust, all that, you know, I mean, there's a lot of dominoes that can go with that. Mm -hmm. well, what does the water do when it hits that? It beads up. Now, I have a really cool video I'll show you later. It's called Never, Never Wet, and then there's another company too. But it's a little more about hydrophilic and hydrophobic uh, concepts. But like, it infuses these materials where it cannot, it doesn't get wet at all. You can stick something in water and come out, and it's completely dry immediately. It's like, it's like super wax, basically. Well, here's the whole idea. You don't need to draw this necessarily. Well, here you can, just this side, or draw something next to it. If you have water, it makes, it's kind of hard to see, but you make a meniscus. We can't do this because it's illegal for me to bring in mercury now, even though my professors, when I was in college, whenever we broke a thermometer, he would just play with it. He would be like, watch this. And then he'd pick it up and he's playing with it on his hands. And later I find out if it soaks in your bloodstream, you go crazy. I'm like, he's crazy. And I'm like, oh, it's not his fault. <laughs> he got a lot of mercury dissolved in his body. Um, notice that one though. It's going, it's opposite, it's convex. Again, I can't show this to you. There is a school that a, um, a kid uh, vaporized accidentally a bunch of mercury into the school, like into the vents. It went up in the air and it vaporized. And all these kids were going out at the end of the day, so it's three o'clock, they all are leaving for basketball games and wrestling tournaments and all that stuff. They had to call, and kids just going home on buses, they had to call every single bus back around Every kid had to come into school. Every parent had to show up, and the kids had to, in an organized way somehow, uh, through, uh, however, the, you had to derobe, you had to lose those clothes. They are now biohazards. So the parents had to bring new clothes for them. They all had to take showers before they left because they were vaporized with uh, mercury uh, vapor. So that's how dangerous mercury is and how people view it. So crazy. All those games were canceled. Everything was, it was nuts. But I digress. What does this have? Water has H bonding. Mercury has LDs, right? So, there is no real attractive force within mercury. So, it's not attracted at all to the glass because glass has certain properties as well, which we can get into, but it's not all that important at the moment. So, because of that, it's not attracted to the side. I know this sounds confusing. Like, wait, you have a stronger force, though. Why won't you be attracting more to yourself? Well, it's extremely attracted to the glass, though. And here, it's not attracted at all to the glass, so it's more attracted to itself. But there's really not much attraction at all because of the fact that there's really nothing going on in there. So it makes this opposite bubble. So the cohesive force, though, is greater here, and the cohesive force is much less here. So it's actually trying to get away from the glass, to be honest. That's actually what's happening. It's actually trying to get away. And then it and it, it's attracted to itself and it makes it weird. It would look weird to see, but we can't play with it, so I'm sorry. Okay, a couple more quick ones. You've heard of this. Uh, whenever you hear an oil commercial, it talks about the viscosity. So it means the liquid's resistance to flow. In middle school, you may have dropped different kinds of, um, of uh, BBs and pieces of wood, I don't know what. You, you could have dropped and see which one flows the, the, the fastest and the slowest down uh, different liquids. Um, to be honest though, to me, I think of it as the thickness, like how thick it is. Um, it always talks about those oil commercials like viscosity breakdown, that's what they always say. Because you don't want really thin oil. You also don't want gunky thick oil. You want that, that nice medium ground. But uh, liquids with large IMFs, and here's the big thing, or Molecular complexity, which, what that really means.
large molar masses. When I say molecular complexity, if you have a really, just think about this, you have a tube with a bunch of different molecules, uh, some molecules in there, or here, better yet, you're running through a fun house, okay? And you have to run through this big, long uh, tunnel, and inside are just simple little, uh, I don't know, uh, beach balls, and you just run through it and they bounce away from you. But then you go back into another one, and there's these really long, well, my, my son just got an eight foot long uh, stuffed caterpillar. It's huge, it's insane. Well, what if you got eight foot long caterpillars, like 3,000 of them all in there instead of beach balls, and now you gotta run through them. Well, you got these long, tangled uh, stuffed animals, it's gonna be harder to get through because of just the complexity. So it would take the same idea, when something drops through a, a tube, those other molecules have to move. These things are real, and they're, if they're larger, they take longer to, to get out of the way, which would have a higher viscosity, okay? All right, just a couple more. Uh, please, no matter where we are, we gotta, this one is important. So vapor pressure. Can, today, I'm, just, I'm trying to give you each of them, and then you're going to practice them tomorrow. So you might have heard of vapor pressure before. I don't know. We just have one or two more things here. Okay. Uh, this is all about boiling. Uh, when I was a kid, I could not remember this, but I never really had a good uh, reference to it. Like, when I'm up in the mountains, is the pressure less or more? I, I would always get it confused when I had to relate it to something else. Vapor pressure itself, like the, it's, it's about the, uh, the ability for the, the liquid to escape versus the atmospheric pressure that's pushing down on it, unfortunately. There's a relationship that's going to happen there. Well, the atmospheric pressure, imagine a tube around your body that goes straight up out into space. How much you have on top of you, the more you have on you, the more pressure you're feeling. So if you go up a new mountain, you have less above you. So you're gonna have less pressure. So that's why something uh, changes in like the boiling points as you move uh, up in the mountains. So we'll, we'll talk about that. So um, vapor pressure first, in general. So this is how it could be written. Sometimes it's a P, sometimes it's an H. This is the energy of the vapor pressure. It's the energy required to vaporize one mole. So if you ever see that, it's how much energy for one mole of a liquid uh, to vaporize. Vaporize is another way to say evaporate. Okay, so we're, we're trying to leave. Okay. Trying to, the molecules are trying to leave. So evaporation, good for you to know. It's endothermic. Why? I have to go from a liquid to a gas. It's got to get greater. It's why you're cold when you get out of the shower. Wait, I thought endothermic, you put heat in. Yes. Your body is getting the heat stolen from you into the molecules. And that's how they can jump from a liquid to a gas. They're stealing your heat, stealing your energy. So, boiling point. For a boiling point to occur, though, I need you to start understanding this. You're going to actually see it tomorrow. Is I need this arrow to be greater than that one. I need the pressure from my liquid to be greater than the pressure that's pushing down on it. If it is, then it's a prison break. They can leave. Okay. Now, this happens naturally. It's not like, wait, I don't get it though. I boil water and it boils, but if you put a puddle on the, uh, some water on the ground, it's not like it stays there forever. It's like, oh, we're gonna have to heat up that table to dry it off, like it evaporates. Well, we're gonna discuss this more and more as we go, but it happens at the surface. So when you blow on it, you're putting energy. You're making those molecules move when you blow on something. Uh, but it's not like the molecules in the bottom, they leave first. I mean, that should just kind of make sense. It's not like, oh, the water down there, that's evaporating. Well, no, it's evaporating on the top. And then once those leave, the next ones leave, and the next ones leave. And we'll talk about all that with impurities and things later. Uh, but let's keep going here. Now, you don't necessarily have to, if you want to just understand this part, um, I just wanted to show you something about just evaporation. Okay, again, if you, this, this will help you just tomorrow, so just take this in for right now, okay? If you had a closed system, I hope we'd agree. If I took this off, maybe all that water could leave, right? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, it would get lower, right? If I took off the cap the next day, it wouldn't be as high. But if I capped it, I don't think we would think like, well, that water's really gonna, that's gonna drop a lot. It's not gonna drop a lot. Well, the reason why is that um, as in the beginning, all that water is going to uh, turn into gas, but as particles, gas particles will start to accumulate, it'll reach a certain pressure. Uh, they'll, 
a volume will be reached. And what happens is eventually, it's not going to all fill up with gas. Some of these gas particles are going to lose energy and drop back down in the liquid. Some of the liquid particles are going to go back into gas. And what we're going to do is reach what we call an equilibrium, which should kind of just make sense in your experiences. Yeah, in a closed container, it never really changes. Well, that's the whole point. Uh, you'll reach an equilibrium. Condensation will equal uh, uh, vaporization or evaporation. Uh, we're going to be looking at that tomorrow in my... Um, in the, the lab that we're doing. You're gonna just practice some simple ideas, okay? That being said, I'll keep that on there. This word you need to know, volatile. It is huge. We, we've talked about it a little bit. You were dealing with volatile liquids last chapter uh, with the uh, ester lab. A volatile, I'll move it a little bit more. Uh, liquids have high vapor pressure, very high vapor pressure, meaning that they can evaporate very fast. If I throw out acetone right now and I just wipe my hand on the table, if I spread it out, it actually would start evaporating immediately because they would have such a small film, they're ready to jump. Sorry, I'm going to move up a little bit more. So, I don't know why I have this here. So, they evaporate quickly, and this is huge. This is the one thing that's opposite. We're going right to the bell, so. I'm uh, postponing a homework assignment. I was supposed to give you one today. I'm going to focus on the, the IMF sheet to finish that up and the lab at for tomorrow. So. Weak IMS. Everything else, when you have high, like boiling point, high this, high that, high service tension, we always say higher IMFs. This one, it's the opposite. Uh, when you have a high vapor pressure, you have really weak IMFs. So uh, the, the higher the vapor pressure, the lower, the, the weaker the IMF. Oh, whoops, I have that right here. Sorry. Kind of. Uh, the other thing, I don't know why I have a big R there. If it's a really large molar mass, if it's really clunky and they're really big, they're not going to evaporate as fast. Think of a, a prison breakout, and you have a, a, a little inmate that's four feet tall and can run really fast, and then you have a seven foot, 700 pound inmate. There you go. They're not getting out that fast. <laughs> they're not. There, it, that's going to take a lot of effort. That's a lot of planning, right? All right, we don't need to do that one yet. All right. Um, last thing, I, I, I just want to start it. Uh, you know what, I will, um, I'll send a little five minute clip on this last one about metals. So I'll send you a little quick uh, YouTube uh, for metals, I'll do that today and send it out before then. They, you would want to get that information though. I just don't want to, by the time I get to it, it's not going to be worth it. So, tomorrow, you want to do it on your iPad, that's great. It'll be very user friendly for you. If you want to just do it uh, on paper, that's fine. But we're in lab, lab at, no lab books needed uh, for tomorrow. Uh, continue working on your IMF sheet though, that is due tomorrow. Okay, so that is in the uh, resource room. Lastly, your ester lab is due by the end of the day today, right? I bumped that many, multiple times. Um, so make sure you get that taken care of. What? Yeah.